This message is brought to you by DoNotAge.org, the longevity research organisation that's on a mission to extend health span for as many people as possible via products that actually work. Start your journey today at DoNotAge.org and use code LAMA for a 10% discount. That's L-L-A-M-A. It's about being as physically active and as well as we possibly can as we grow older. I apply the nutrition side of things, a little bit of learning, and uh, hopefully we can uh, figure out the social connectivity that we need as we get a little bit older as well. Hello and welcome to the Live Long and Master Aging podcast. I'm Peter Bowes. This is where we explore the science and stories behind human longevity. This episode is brought to you in association with Amazentis, a Swiss life science company that's pioneering cutting-edge, clinically validated cellular nutrition under its timeline brand. Now, a familiar sign of aging is frailty. Physical strength is important throughout our lives, but as we grow older... Poor muscle health and all that goes with that is very often the beginning of the end, that slow, sometimes rapid decline that we all want to avoid. And there's plenty of evidence that muscle weakness puts older people at risk of developing other health problems. Well, thankfully, there is much we can do to improve our chances of living a long and healthy life while nurturing our physical strength. Indeed, longevity is very closely linked to our functional ability, as it is sometimes described. I'm joined from Canada by Professor Stuart Phillips, Director of the Physical Activity Centre of Excellence, or PACE, at the Department of Kinesiology at McMaster University in Hamilton, in Ontario. Stuart, it's great to talk to you. It's a pleasure to be speaking with you, Peter. Thanks for having me on the show. Tell me a little bit more about Pace. I've uh, watched some of your videos <laughs> online. It looks like a great place. Yeah, Pace is uh, it is a fantastic place. It's a real pleasure to be affiliated with it. It's a community access uh, exercise facility that uh, five what we call special populations uh, enjoy the use of. So uh, older people, uh, uh, which we define, and I'm always cautious to say this, over the age of 55, um, and then people who are undergoing cardiac rehabilitation, We also treat uh, cancer patients or people who have undergone treatment for cancer and then people with spinal cord injuries and people with multiple sclerosis as well. So uh, five fairly vulnerable populations that have probably adaptive prescriptions for their physical activity for health. I don't think any of us should be shy about acknowledging being an older person. I'm <laughs> over 55 and uh, it, it feels great from where I'm sitting. So I have, I have one more year and I can join. We need to have a positive attitude about that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Now, just before we, we delve into that a little deeper, one of the privileges of doing this podcast is actually getting to talk to people like you in different countries around the world. And the question I find myself asking everyone at the moment, living through the crazy, difficult times, the pandemic with COVID-19. It's interesting to me just how different countries are responding and how those people like you working in this space are actually responding to the the very difficult circumstances. And I imagine running something like PACE, there are all sorts of considerations that you've had to make in recent weeks in terms of bringing people back to that area where you can teach people, where you can nurture people, where people can enjoy their physical exercise. Yeah, I, you know, COVID has had a huge impact um, on our university and probably uh, I, I don't think that we're any different from anybody else. Uh, we've been out of the university since March the 9th. Uh, we closed down all of our research projects as of March 13th and uh, PACE closed around the same time. Um, we're very cautious in reopening uh, and PACE with the vulnerable populations, as you might imagine, is um receiving a, a little bit of a, a slower, very cautious treatment to bring people back to what is a, a, essentially a, a large gym with mostly adapted physical activity equipment. So uh, those those folks too, we've, we've initiated some online uh, classes. And so we've got sort of face-to-face instructors, physiotherapists, kinesiologists, um, giving an exercise prescription to uh, a number of these folks, but nothing on this type of scale that we were doing before. 
And it does, doesn't it, highlight the what I sometimes describe as the collateral damage from COVID-19, the fact that people haven't been able to, or it's, it's been more difficult to exercise in a, a gym setting uh, as they traditionally might have done, and, and also just to associate with others, perhaps other like-minded people who they might have got together with as a group to, to run, to play tennis, to do whatever you do in terms of your chosen form of exercise. It does highlight the problems I think that we're going to have to face in, in the coming weeks and months because of that loss of freedom. Yeah, you know, it's an interesting uh, point that you raise. One of the things that uh, my lab has been really interested in for the past probably about five or six years has been the what we call disuse uh, episode. And I think clinically, most people would identify bed rest or hospitalization as being the epitome of that or having a limb immobilized as a sort of local muscular disuse and the atrophy that goes along with that. Uh, But we see these periodic um, episodes of disuse or simply, if you like, convalescing from illness or doing what their people are supposed to be doing right now, which is essentially sheltering in place and uh, avoiding contact with other people as being actually pivotal in an older person's life because they decondition during these phases. And, you know, a younger person, probably not that big a deal. They recover, they bounce back. But the older we get, it, it gets more difficult. And I think uh, most clinicians would acknowledge that a, a bout of physical inactivity, bed rest or uh, illness is a, is a watershed moment for older people. And so COVID and the social side of things, as you mentioned, it are, are really big deals in older people's lives. So uh, this has had an impact on people beyond the physical activity side of things, but also from the social side of things, for sure. I'd like to uh, talk in a little bit more depth about that issue, which I, I find very interesting, about the deconditioning that happens when we when we stop exercising for a period of time. Before we do that, though, I like to give all my guests on this podcast an opportunity for purposes of full disclosure, just to talk about any affiliations that you may well have that are relevant to this conversation. And of course, this is a, a podcast that is being made in association with Amazentis, uh, a company that I know you work with as well. Yeah, so I'm uh, I'm I'm privileged and very happy to be part of the scientific advisory board of uh, Amazentis. Uh, Chris Rinch, who's uh, the head CEO at Amazentis, has uh, called me, I'm not sure in how long ago now, probably about seven or eight years, and uh, invited me on board. And it's been a company that's uh, it's been an interesting journey, an interesting trajectory. Uh, and I like to say it's uh, something that's paid dividends because it's finally beginning to move into my area, which is uh, an interest in human physiology. So, uh, yeah, it's uh, it's a privilege to be associated with them and an honor to be here uh, telling you something about what the great work they do is. Yeah, I agree with that. And, and we, we will talk about the the melding of, of the two areas of, of exercise and nutrition and diet, uh, which essentially is what this company is doing and, and through your work as, as well, because uh, all the different pillars, I suppose, uh, are crucially important as we move forward and, and as we age. One thing I, I wanted to, to start with was the, I suppose, the, the common idea of what an older person is like when you describe whether it's a a media image of uh, an older person, someone who's maybe just retired, or whether it's just what you are brought up with. And that is the image of a a slightly stooped person who is taking life a little easier, perhaps sitting down more, taking it easy. I think you could refer to the rocking chair if you like. It's that kind of image of what it's like to be old. And it's essentially what we're all brought up with to believe that that is how it's going to be. Now, I'm I'm sure you'll agree with me that that's not the way we would want it to be. Certainly, I don't see myself as that kind of older person, that kind of lifestyle. But maybe you could encapsulate why that image is so way out from reality. Yeah, I I think if you had uh, probably asked somebody about 30 or 40 years ago, they would have said that, um, yeah, the retirement age and, uh, you know, getting older is associated with maybe doing a little bit less. And, And I think more recently, people have begun to challenge the notion that aging per se is associated with a decline in all of our physical functions and that we should do less and and maybe not aspire to do maybe a little bit more. Um, so people's uh, vision of how they age and creating their, I call it their future self, uh, has probably changed drastically in the last, I would say, probably three or four decades 
with the realization that um, you know you you spend a lot of your life working, uh, you hopefully accumulate some uh, assets and some wealth, and you should be enjoying time when you don't have to work anymore, and uh, maybe engaging in activities that uh, you didn't otherwise have time for. So, uh, you know, our view is the obviously physical activity and mobility per se is important in that phase. And, uh, you know, on your show, I know you've had guests that discuss the concept of health span. Um, I'm interested in lifespan, of course, I think we all are, but um, I'm uh, going to quote somebody uh, from the Mayo Clinic named James Kirkland, who's a prolific aging researcher, and would say that uh, nobody wants to live to be 120 and feel 120. So uh, we're, uh, we, we focus on mobility as a key part of aging and health span. And I think the major aspect of facilities like PACE is to try and preserve people's health. Most people's vision of, uh, of aging in, is uh, littered with uh, increasing risks for certain chronic diseases. And uh, it is rare, I'll, I'll admit, in, in our research that we do with older people, to find people who are medication-free and are not with, you know, one or two chronic health conditions. And so, you know, really physical activity, good nutrition is trying to combat and push back the age of that first chronic condition because we know the second comes closer and then number three comes closer to number two. Uh, and so not to age with morbidity and have premature mortality, but to age um, as healthily as we can for as long as we can. And one of the, the key issues which you've alluded to is the loss of muscle. It's not physical ability to do the walk, to do the hike or, or the run or whatever goal that you aim for. But it is that gradual loss of, of muscle strength that, that holds so many people back. Yeah. So, um, I mean, this is the phenomenon of sarcopenia. Um, that name is now you know, almost 40 years old and it really initially described the decline in muscle mass. And But it's been sort of uh, I think co-opted a little bit now and, and, and is associated with function as well. So it's, it's not just a decline in mass per se, which I think a lot of, again, uh, clinicians who work in ICUs would identify as being a, a very common outcome associated with, uh, things like COVID and spending long, long periods of time in bed and under catabolic conditions. But the slow age-related loss of muscle mass is something that is also associated with declines in muscle function. So, you know, if you took the checklist and said, these are activities of daily living, can you get out of a chair? Can you get up and down a flight of stairs? And once you begin to say, you know, I have a problem with those, or I absolutely can't do do those things, then that's when you're in full-time institutionalized care and people's obviously quality of life declines quite rapidly then. And there's no drug that can treat this condition? No, people have tried and uh, I think people would continue to try. There are uh, various classes of drugs that probably will find their use in select clinical populations, but I don't think... Uh, that in uh, your lifetime or my lifetime, we're going to see the uh, the magic so-called anti-aging pill that will uh, allow us to keep our muscle mass and our muscle function uh, into our eighth, ninth, and tenth decades. So uh, physical activity, good nutrition are really uh, all we have right now. And as I mentioned earlier, it, one of the concerning things is the rate of, of loss of, of muscle mass and, and your ability to do those activities after a, a period of uh, bed rest or illness or just not doing that activity, just not doing that daily walk or not going to the gym. You can decline after a certain age very quickly, can't you? Yeah, and I think that probably surprises a lot of people to know that um, we've done some work where after the age of probably, I would say, about 60, or, or our subjects were over age 60, that uh, two weeks of simply taking uh, a reduced number of daily steps, and you know everybody knows the 10,000 daily step goal that we're supposed to hit uh, as a good sort of biomarker of uh, obviously health and reducing risk for chronic diseases. Um, and when people take around 1,000 to 1,500 steps per day, which doesn't seem like a lot, and it really isn't, um, but bear in mind that a hospitalized patient might take about 750 steps per day. I know, having wearing uh, a Fitbit, uh, that the current <laughs> during the current COVID conditions, I'm probably averaging a miserable number of about 2,500 or 3,000 steps if I don't 
take it into my own hands and get out there and take the steps. So, you know, but for these older folks taking that number of daily steps, we found that with only two weeks, they became uh, insulin resistant. Uh, They saw declines in their rates of making new muscle proteins and were beginning to approach a state of what we would call uh, pre-frailty. In other words, they would have a functional decline that it would be not impossible to reverse. They'd have to do some rehabilitation to recover it. But without that, that they would uh, be accelerating their rate of sarcopenia and their trajectory towards uh, you know what we call full bone uh, frailty, where people really do experience declines in mobility and uh, lots of other health conditions as well. And just a, a little aside, you mentioned the ten thousand steps that we are supposed to aspire to, and that a lot of us try to achieve, or, or greater than that, in a day. Is there any science behind the number of ten thousand? <laughs> That's a good question. No, I think that the, the science behind ten thousand is uh, sorely lacking. Uh, you know, ten thousand is a nice round number. And I think if you trace its origin back, you can probably uh, link it to a Japanese company that picked that number uh, and associate it with one of the very early pedometer models that was that, that they gave out. Um, but no, uh, you know, it could be 5,000, it could be 8,000, but we definitely know down around sort of 3,000 or less that people begin to run into problems. And if you think about a hospitalized patient at 750 steps, I, I challenge anybody to do all of their activities of daily living and, and, and get below a thousand steps. But that's what people in hospital where the de facto treatment, you know, is bed rest. Uh, that's what they do. But uh, no, nothing scientific about 10,000. I could probably probably say that the physical activity guidelines at 150 minutes per week, uh, there is more science about, but 10,000 steps per day is, uh, <laughs> seems a bit random. Yeah, it's a bit random, but it is, as you say, it's a nice round figure and it is something decent. It's probably four or five miles, I, yes. I think, for, for most people. It, <laughs> it is for me. And it, it's, uh, it's a nice sort of mental goal. And for me, it's always the goal of trying to get 10,000 or more or 12,000, 15, Yeah, 000, exactly. So. I th- again, I think it's a number that gets picked and uh, it's a good peg, uh, you know. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. You've mentioned step reduction, which in a lot of your literature, you you abbreviate as SR. And Mm. this this is a a central part of your work of understanding what you mean by uh, step reduction. Yeah, so step reduction um, as a model, we would call it sort of the vernacular around our lab is to call it bed rest light. So again, the the hallmark clinical model of deconditioning and uh, muscle loss, and that is, you know, a, a true watershed moment for older people uh, is hospitalization and then bed rest. Um, I don't think that any uh, older person would be unfamiliar with uh, the concept of having a knee replaced or a hip replaced, which are orthopedic procedures that a lot of older people undergo. Uh, And then the need for physical rehabilitation on the back end of that type of procedure. Um, We think, however, that generic hospitalizations for surgeries, or we actually conceived the model more or a little bit around uh, if somebody went into hospital for flu um, every February in Canada, for example, and probably elsewhere in North America is peak flu season. Uh, and of course, we've now entered a new phase where you can talk about deconditioning during peak COVID season, if you like. The recovery from that is, uh, you know, hopefully good and people exit the hospital, but the recognition of a need for rehabilitation in those situations is pretty poor. So we were trying to highlight with our reduced step model, which is not hospitalization, it doesn't have an underlying uh, pathology associated with it, but the simple act of taking less daily steps and less physical activity as being uh, a state when people decondition and then have a hard time recovering. And uh, older people, uh, after we've taken that drastic reduction in their daily steps, even with two weeks resumption of their normal daily steps, do not fully recover that uh, fully uh, healthy state, if you like, the uh, pre-step reduction state. So it it obviously takes a lot longer to recover than it does to to induce the effect. One of the side effects of not taking as much physical activity as perhaps we should. It it isn't necessarily linked to our ability to to go for a walk or to go for a run. There are many diseases that can result 
uh, as again I mentioned, collateral damage. It it isn't just focused on our ability to do stuff. There could be other diseases brewing that we're not immediately aware of, but could ultimately be traced back to our lack of muscle mass, muscle health, and and that lack of physical activity. Yeah, I mean, I I think that the one that probably most people could uh, identify with is is type two diabetes. I mean. Uh, the deconditioning that is associated with all kinds of things and just a normal sedentary lifestyle is obviously a contributing factor to the development of type 2 diabetes. And uh, key to that then is um, the, the organelle inside the cell and inside muscle cell, which uh, Amazentis has been quite concerned with, and that's the cellular mitochondria. We we know for, um, we've known for decades that uh, Periods of inactivity and deconditioning result in this, uh, the, the mitochondria, um, having impaired function. And I think, you know, layer that on top of poor diet and layer it on top of the aging process per se, you begin to see all of these things essentially, uh, confluence together to create a situation where people are at tremendous risk of developing type 2 diabetes and then the associated complications with that. Well, let's delve into that. You mentioned Amazentis and their work with uh, mitochondrial health. Where do you come in to that? Uh, the whole, I think, point of talking to you today is to try to join the dots between cellular biology, physical strength, exercise and nutrition, because they are all connected, aren't they? And we'll continue this conversation in just a moment. Hey, quick question for you. Are you someone who wants to be fit, healthy, and happy? And what if I told you you could get your dream body by simply just listening to a podcast? I'm Josh. And I'm KG, and we're the hosts of the Fit, Healthy, and Happy podcast. Listen, we get it. Fitness isn't easy. Carbs, no carbs. Just stop, okay? It doesn't have to be that complicated. And that's why we made this podcast. We get straight to the facts so you can become your best you. So the way to check us out is click the link in the show notes or search Fit, Healthy, and Happy podcast on any of the major podcast platforms. We'll see you soon. Yeah, they, they they are, and and uh, it's an interesting uh, journey, as I mentioned, that uh, Amazentis embarked on. I mean, it it, it grew out of um, essentially an innovation park in Lausanne in Switzerland, uh, associated. It's a terrific area for nutritional science. Um, uh, the Nestle Research Center is there, and a lot of partnerships with the uh, local universities. So. Uh, the, the part that drew me to uh, to Amazentis was really the fact that they grounded their uh, research in in science. So they've spent a lot of time um, developing the models and developing the basis of evidence from uh, all the way from worms up to mice, and then now they are conducting trials in in humans. So. Uh, I, I'll admit that I've been patiently waiting <laughs> because it's uh, we don't do uh, we don't do worms we don't do mice it's all humans for for our lab um, and you know the the evidence base that's been built has been tremendously good and I've been really impressed actually with the scientific trajectory that the company's taken uh, and the time they took uh, before they went uh, public and then have released the product that they have. And it's backed by a, a lot of good research and, and really impressive that they're targeting the molecular mechanisms first before they come at this with a different sort of concept, which is usually marketing driven. And then uh, let's try and find out the science. So uh, the mitochondria is a cellular uh, organelle, is the powerhouse of the cell. Skeletal muscle is the locomotor organ of your entire body is packed with mitochondria. So you know, when we draw the or the organ that is central to our research at skeletal muscle. And uh, so the interest in what the compound that Amazentis has isolated, urolithin A, um, and its function in mitochondria has been interesting for us to see. And we're, we're actually eager to conduct uh, some research with this compound because we think that the upside of it is is actually for aging people is is tremendous. Specifically, we're talking about a, a pure, a very pure form of urolithin A. They call mitopure. And that's the compound you'll be experimenting with, because uh, if it were left to us eating pomegranates, yeah. not all of us can actually benefit. Kind of simplifying it here, but uh, the, yeah. the fact is, we can't all benefit from eating a lot of fruits because our bodies work in in different ways. So the the exciting part of this, to me, is the is that there is a, a synthetic form 
of urolithin A that we could all potentially benefit from. Yeah, and, and I think um, you know a lot of the advances in these nutraceuticals or these naturally occurring compounds um, have been when you've got the isolated compound per se, and uh, and yet when you look at some of the epidemiology, maybe you could sort of trace. And I, I use compounds like resveratrol for example as being a, a compound that's found. Uh, in relatively high abundance in red wine. And then people say, oh, well, look, this is part of the the French red wine paradox here. Um, and then when you begin to do the calculations of how much resveratrol you would need, uh, you'd have to drink a lot of wine. Uh, and similarly speaking, you'd have to drink a lot of pomegranate juice as the precursor uh, to allow our gut microbiome to generate enough uh, urolithin uh, to achieve the benefits. But, you know, there's something in people who eat a lot of this uh, uh, pomegranate naturally saying, well, look, they've got diff levels that are a little bit higher than the most of us. But, you know, what Amazantis has done is purified the compound and then uh, put it in a form that we can ingest that would allow urolithin A to reproducibly go up. And so it's not dependent on our gut microbiome or ingesting a rather large amount of pomegranate juice. But th they have done the experiments, um, interestingly enough, with the pomegranate juice. And you can see a little increase, but not, not as high as you would like to get it up to to have the therapeutic effects. And uh, as you just mentioned just now, I think one of the exciting things is that you are all about people. You're not working with nematode worms. You're not working with fruit flies or, or mice or, or rats. And I think for a lot of people looking from the outside into science, that is crucially important that yeah. this element, this relatable element to what you're doing with, with older people and communities who can benefit immediately from this kind of science, that we aren't just talking about a laboratory scenario, that this is real life. Yeah, it, it, it's uh, science is is a difficult concept, I think, for people to understand a little bit when we when people do experiments in, as you said, uh, you know, uh, C. elegans worm uh, to a uh, fruit fly to a mouse, and then some people. I, and I, I'm I I will admit to taking some liberties with sort of pushing the envelope when people say, "Here it is in mice," and I'm like, "Just says in mice," and so tell me how it relates to humans. And I think that that's the really impressive part with uh, with Amazentis is that they have taken uh, a very basic science route to develop the concepts. They've shown proof of what we call proof of concept science. They've built the molecular story and they've escalated up the sort of, if you like, species chain all the way to doing studies in, in humans. Um, and that's where the data uh, that I've seen gets really impressive, to be honest with you. And, uh, you know, I've been at McMaster now for uh, 23 years, and I'll be honest, it, it, I can probably count on one hand the number of things that have come across my desk where I've, I've, I've been scientifically surprised. And this is one of them uh, where that story has really borne, uh, you'll pardon the pun because of the pomegranate, but some, some true fruit. And uh, so it's exciting to see that. And always, um, I think, fantastic when a company has taken their time to build the scientific story before going to the commercial route. So uh, yeah, kudos to Amazentis for, for doing that, for sure. One thing that's always, uh, to some extent, challenged me, and my views are constantly changing, and that is how we balance the, you could describe them as the interventions that we apply to ourselves. Now, clearly, exercise is a big one, a good, healthy diet, without going into the details of what that diet is, but a good, healthy diet. Well, let's go into a little bit of the detail. For me, it's a, a mostly plant-based diet and, and very, very little meat and a little bit of fish. That's the kind of diet that I, from the science, believe is probably the best for me. I know others disagree with that. But it's a balance between a healthy diet, a certain spirituality, a, a zen-like lifestyle to some extent, family, friends, nurturing that side of our existence. And also, and this is the bit that I've struggled with sometimes, uh, how many supplements to take? The, and the question has always been, if I'm getting everything else right, like the exercise and the diet and the, the Zen lifestyle, do I really need supplements? And, I'm, and that comes right to the point of this conversation, of course, about a supplement, a nutritional supplement that could potentially hugely benefit me. The question in my mind is, well, where do I stop? Because there are so many choices. 
Yeah. Well, for starters, let me say that your the first three things you mentioned there. I I I'm, I give a talk where I talk about health and uh, not say longevity as much, but health span. Uh, and I talk about uh, health span being a three legged stool. And I say that physical activity, you know, in my world, uh, coming from a kinesiology department, is obviously is king. Um, good nutrition and the diet you described would certainly be part of the. Uh, spectrum of diets that I say is associated with good health is, you know, if you want, that's the queen. Um, and then I don't know where it fits in the royal court, but certainly social connections and a society that, it, and we can use the sort of blue zone example as uh, a society that doesn't have ageism as part of its sort of structure that values uh, people as they get older people still find purpose in life. They have some sort of social support, whether it's their friends or their church or something that sort of gives meaning to their life, whatever that is. And then the supplements are sort of, uh, I, I call them a fringe part of the nutritional equation. Uh, and I think that now we are beginning to hone in on one or two things that could probably, uh, if we had more of them in our diet, um, if you like, I, I call it sort of nutritional fine tuning of uh, of the profile that most of us would probably say, well, yeah, I'm not getting enough of that. Or I, even if I'm doing this, I'm living in an environment with pollution or I've got something else. So I can't live in a blue zone. Um, so what else can I do to sort of maximize my chances from a nutritional standpoint? And that's where the supplements kind of live uh, when I describe them to people. Uh, in terms of the overall vernacular. But yeah, I mean, you can obsess about these things to the nth degree. And I think when you really peel back the the science, there's probably a, a sort of a dirty half dozen that I would say, yeah, that's that's worth it. Uh, and then after that, I'd, I'd say, OK, you know, maybe in, a, in an ideal environment. Um, but then uh, something's going to get us all at some point. So uh, live the best life you can and live for as long and as healthy as you can, hopefully. Yeah, I, I tend to see now that that supplement side as my nutritional insurance. Yeah, but it just kind of fills the gap. <laughs> yeah, no, it's a, it's a good way to look at it. I like I said, I don't think you can you can't build your base with supplements, and you can't out supplement a bad diet if you like. But uh, you can you can add to it for sure. Now, just uh, talking about diet, and especially diet as it applies to older people, and uh, I gave you a little summary there of, of my kind of diet, which involves uh, virtually no red meat, some fish, and uh, a lot of fruits and vegetables. And one issue, of course, as you get older, is your protein intake. And generally, my understanding and my reading of the science, and again, as I apply it to myself, is that I can survive on a relatively low protein diet still in my late 50s, but there may well come a point that it would be sensible to up that protein at some point as I move into that area of my life that frailty could become an issue. Yeah, I think there are two aspects of uh, of protein as, as it applies to aging. And you sort of refer to this, I don't know what you want to call it, a seesaw point or a tipping point that uh, probably prior to a certain point in your life, protein, not a big deal if you're getting uh, the macronutrients that you talked about from the types of foods that you talked about. And, you know, a lot of my work is, is related around protein, for sure, um, that you're good. Uh, and I think the biggest driver, and most people would probably agree with me on this, that of your muscle and muscle function is definitely still physical activity. Uh, at some point in our lives, we're not really sure where that is. But let's say 60 as a as a tipping point seesaw point uh it makes more sense to get a little bit more protein in your diet because you're losing muscle mass and as one of the substrates and key drivers of retention of muscle it, it, protein is is a key building block but again uh you can't do it without being physically active um one of the aspects of protein as we get a little bit older as well and i'm not sure whether this is more food related or just protein per se um is the support of our immune system and that's something i've wondered a little bit about as people get older, because we obviously know that immune system function declines with aging, uh, as whether more protein is a good idea from supporting that system. Um, so again, a lot of the evidence uh, is generated from experimental animal models, and I have to take a bit of a leap, leap of faith to be able to say that this is something that's going to work in humans, which I think it's it's a you know a big step up. 
But um, it certainly, at least from my perspective, makes sense to consume more protein as you get older, uh, probably uh, after or around age 60. And I'm just curious, do you have a, yourself a preferred source of protein? I would probably say that uh, the majority of my protein, if I were to look at it from a dietary basis, comes from dairy. Oh, that's interesting. I, I didn't <laughs> expect you to say that either. Yeah, I, you know, I, 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 I sort of, uh, I straddle a line where uh, I talk about, you know, higher protein intakes. I, I don't think that the recommended dietary allowance would be uh, sufficient, uh, particularly for older people. Um, but from a nutrient-dense protein source, I, I think that dairy probably uh, tops the list. Um, I, I, I eat meat. I don't eat a lot of meat. Uh, I eat fish as well. I eat chicken. Um, I don't, I'm certainly not on the sort of all the way to the other side uh, carnivore-type scale. Um, but uh, I would certainly be the first to admit that plant-based sources of protein are a good source of protein as well. Um, I always... I like to push the nutritional people only hypothesis and say that, uh, you know, people say you can't outrun a bad diet. And I said, well, I don't think you can out, out nutrition inactivity either. So uh, you have to be physically active. And um, I, I do tend to use Jack LaLanne's quote to say that uh, physical activity is king and or, or exercise is king and nutrition is queen. When you put them together, you've got a kingdom. But I don't think you can do it all with nutrition. So uh, I, I like to say as well that, that uh, being physically active is the forgiver of a lot of sins. So <laughs> even if you've got a a not great diet. Yeah, I know that's a, that's a great way to put it. And of course, it all talking about nutrition and, and the array of different kinds of protein sources that you just talked about, it does illustrate how we are all uniquely different in terms of how we respond to these foods. Yeah, and I think that that's probably, you know, one of the greatest breakthroughs of probably the last sort of five to 10 years is uh, the realization in uh, nutrition, nutritional science of nutrigenomics and the individualization of probably a lot of people's dietary patterns that at some point, I think we're going to see, uh, I don't know when, but uh, for at some point, you're going to see people saying, you know what, you need more of based on this type of nutritional or this type of genomic or transcriptomic blueprint, if you like. So if exercise is king, how would you prescribe exercise? Again, we're all different. We all have our preferred regimes in terms of what we do every day. But uh, is there a, a recipe for good exercise? Yeah, it's a great question. Uh, I mean, I think that um, I, my colleague at McMaster, his name's Marty Gabala. He's a high intensity interval guy, and he's made a convert out of me. Um, and in another it's almost seems like another era of my life. I, I actually ran marathons. I, I can't imagine looking at myself now that I actually did that. But, um, you know, that was the thing at the time of the group of people I was associated with. And that was actually a form of uh, sort of socialization, if you like. Um, I don't think people need to run marathons. Uh, I think people need to keep their aerobic peak, their, their sort of top end gear, if you like, as high as possible. Um, and Dr. Gabal has convinced me that that only takes a, a few sort of spikes in our exercise intensity, high intensity work per week. Uh, but at the same time, um, we have to retain our strength. And I think particularly as people get older, uh, they need to be mindful of the strength it takes to do activities of daily living. And so I, while I don't specifically subscribe to practice getting in and out of a chair, I'm not sure that that's uh, the right way to do it. I do subscribe to prescription of strength training. So uh, at some point, you're going to need to be concerned about how strong you are, because I think that begins to play a much bigger factor as people get older uh, to accomplish the things they want to do in daily life. And it probably... I think the concept in textbooks of aerobic people are over here and resistance people are over here is uh, grossly oversimplified. And in terms of the health benefits that either activity sort of gives a person, they're probably much, much closer together than they are further apart. Aerobic exercise, top end VO2 peak, aerobic 
power, if you want to call it that, strength exclusive to this domain. But health benefit wise, you can put a pretty big circle around both and say that, you know, optimizing both would be the best prescription. And for someone who just hates the idea of a gym, hates the idea of that, uh, you know, that fast aerobic exercise that you might get by doing ropes or kettlebells or whatever it is that uh, you can do at a gym and would prefer simply to go for a long walk every day. Yeah. That's pretty much all you need, isn't it, to maintain you know, a good, vigorous, get out of breath for maybe a, 10 minutes or so and then pace yourself on the way home. If you did that 30 to 40 minutes, seven days a week, you'd be doing pretty well. If you did that, uh, I think you'd be in great shape, to be honest with you. I, I, again, the high intensity part of things doesn't need to be an all out sprint on a bike or a 100 meter repeat or a 400 meter repeat on a track for sure. Uh, we've actually got some work that uh, hopefully uh, people will be seeing in publication soon showing that in some cardiac rehabilitation patients, even uh, taking a flight of stairs fairly rapidly um, up a flight of stairs um, one or two or three times a week is uh, sufficient to be able to get these people in pretty good shape. So I think we're beginning to sort of hone in on just how small these versions of high intensity training can be and how practical you can make them. So if there's a hill, try and walk a little faster up the hill. If there are stairs, try ascending them at a fast but comfortable pace and obviously not breakneck. Um, and these are the types of things that, that just sort of accelerate the top end. But if you're out for a walk seven days a week, uh, my bet is that you're in pretty darn good shape. Just going back to what you said about marathons, you said you'd run a few. <laughs> I run a few marathons, five in all, one in London, four in Los Angeles, a couple of decades ago. And my mind, my brain tells me I would love to run a marathon again. My oh, yeah. me, it probably wouldn't be a very good idea and I probably won't be running any more marathons. But and as you said, and I totally agree with you, we don't need to run marathons to stay healthy or in, or in good shape. But the question is, why, perhaps when we're younger, do we feel as if we want to run marathons and what do you think we get out of it? Yeah, it's a great question. You know, I, I often have thought about this uh, from the perspective of uh, we had a session at a conference that I attended that I spoke in. And uh, I'll sort of use the analogy here is that uh, I think a lot of people are familiar with the Cooper Longitudinal Aerobic Study. And this is Ken Cooper's cl clinic where we derive a lot of the data for the benefits of aerobic exercise. And Ken Cooper, for a lot of years, he really talked about, you know, weightlifting and muscle. You, you know, that was just weight that you had to carry around when you ran, when you ran long distances. Uh, and the marathon has always stood out as a sort of a, a real milestone distance for a lot of people as, you know, I wish if I, I could do anything, I could run a marathon. And I kind of joked with people to say that, you know, if Ken Cooper were a, a, a weightlifter as opposed to a runner, we'd know a lot more about weightlifting than we would about running because it would be the Cooper longitudinal weightlifting study. So, <laughs> but, um, you know, I, so I think our fascination with aerobic exercise and our, our willingness to uh, say that this is a, this is a pinnacle of health if we can do this has been a little bit around weight control for sure. Um, but the distance of the marathon has been one of these sort of, I think, laudable, you know, almost unachievable goals. And yet it's probably within the reach of a lot more people than we than we realize. Uh, in other words, if you're willing to put the time in and um, I, I, I hate to say this, but uh, torture yourself because I found it a little bit of torture um, and I will I will never do one again. I can guarantee you that. Um, that, that most people could do it. And uh, if completion of the marathon is really the goal, uh, you, you know, if, if that's, you know, if it takes you five, six hours, then then so be it. Um, but I, I don't know what it is around marathons. They've become an event now that is beyond just grueling running. So people, it, you mentioned London, costumes, uh, water stops, crowds, lots of appreciation and charitable causes that go along with that. And so it's personal as well as uh, if you like outside organizations. But uh, the fascination with um, running 26.2 miles, I suppose, is 
hold something in people's minds as opposed to saying getting under a bar and bench pressing your own body weight. But (laughs) I can see the fascination of both personally. Yeah, I think you've summed it up very nicely. And and I think it is in big part the social side of it. And of course, marathons have evolved into Spartan races and obstacle course races, which are are huge these days, or maybe not so much these days. Sadly, we can't. They're just beginning to start again, I think, Spartan races. But uh, it's been quite challenging to take part in these um, mass uh, participant events. But uh, I think certainly for me, I mean, running 26.2 miles by yourself doesn't sound particularly exciting, but running with 25,000 other people and the adrenaline that goes with that and the sense of achievement at the end, I can see why I did it and and why lots of other people (laughs) continue to want to do it. Yeah. So let me ask you, and I know you've listened to one or two of these podcasts before with other guests. A favourite question of mine is generally in terms of your psyche, as you think about your longevity, your health span, what you aspire to be like in 20 or 30 years time and the kind of life you want to be living, and especially as it applies to your work and what you've learned through your your work uh, in exercise. Is there something that you apply to yourself on a, on a daily basis that you think will help achieve that great health span? Yeah, look, uh, I think full disclosure is that uh, I'm married to another exercise physiologist. So she's a cardiovascular exercise physiologist. So you sort of have the the heart and lung person and I'm the muscle person. So um, she's constantly cajoling me and trying to get me to do more aerobic work. And I'm constantly trying to get her to do a little bit more weightlifting. But, uh, you know, yeah, our vision of, uh, of aging, um, I'm a few years ahead of her is is definitely to be as physically active as possible. Um, I think one of the biggest joys uh, that both of us have in our life has been obviously our kids and then uh, the ability to travel uh, with our kids. So we have we spent a sabbatical in California with our with our children when they were young. And then we spent a sabbatical living in the UK for a year. And, uh, you know, those have been. Um, from our family and uh, that standpoint have been absolutely fantastic experiences. And, you know, I'd, I'd, I'd hope that we could begin to uh, to do those with uh, with some grandchildren at, at, at some point as well. So um, I think it's uh, you learn things when you travel and see other places that you just can't teach in a classroom or learn from reading or watching a movie. And, um, you know, the key to being being able to do those things is still to be as physically able to do them as, as you can. It's it's tough to do a walking tour around Rome or Paris if you can't walk more than uh, half a kilometer, as an example. So, uh, yeah, it's uh, it's about being as physically active uh, and as well as we possibly can as we grow older. I apply the nutrition side of things, a little bit of learning, and uh, hopefully we can uh, figure out the social connectivity that we need as we get a little bit older as well. And uh, regular listeners to these podcasts will probably know what I'm going to say next, and that is that you highlighted what the vast majority of people highlight, and that is the element of children and grandchildren in your life as you grow older. And I think it comes into this, apart from just enjoying the moment and being physically able to enjoy the moment, it's also part of sharing the wisdom and perhaps sharing the fruits of of your lifetime and what you've managed to learn. And hopefully you you can pass on, not just to children, but as an educator, to others as well. Yeah, you know, look, I I mean, my career, uh, I've been uh, really blessed with having colleagues that uh, have been fantastic supports and have allowed me to do a lot of things. But um, the thing I take the greatest pride in at this point is uh, is the folks that I've uh, been able to work with, students, master's students, PhD students, postdoctoral fellows who uh, continue to push me. Uh, They're always younger than me now, so uh, (laughs) they push me in a lot of directions. And uh, it's their their um, continued career success that I take a lot of pleasure in. So it's it's almost that they're my extended family, and now they're married, they have kids, and you know, uh, so it's it's fantastic to see uh, that sort of uh, as you say passed down of uh, wisdom. I think there's a little bit of wisdom I've passed down, but they've obviously been able to transcend some of the things I've been able to teach them as well. well actually, talking of, of doing that, you're very active in social media, and I suppose that is a, a key forum for you in, in terms of sharing that wisdom. 
Yeah, I, I I take a lot of, um, I'll call it friendly abuse from my colleagues who are my age or older at this, the time I spend on social media. Um, but I got, I got on it, um, you know, probably about a decade ago as sort of a, you know, oh, let's just see what this is about. And it wasn't very goal-directed, uh, but it has become goal-directed. And I, I do think that, um, you know, in Canada, uh we are we're a public education system uh that is supported by taxpayer dollars uh I, you know so then indirectly i'm i'm essentially a civil servant i my salary comes from taxpayers money uh and i think there's a bit of a duty to uh to try and translate science to allow people to see what it is that uh i do um and certainly i i do think that a lot of the growth in understanding has now be it's gone beyond the so-called ivory tower and there's plenty of people who I've come, I've come into contact with on social media that have um have changed uh, the way I, I I think about things changed the stories I tell about the science uh that that it is that we do um and have forced me to change a little bit about my approach in terms of translating the science we do so yes it's uh it's been a bit of a, an epiphany, but but a good one, I think. And, and, and I think it's uh, who knows where it's going to be ten years from now. But it's uh, it's been amazing to see the proliferation of just general people's knowledge and, and getting into areas that I would have thought would be the exclusive domain uh, only ten or twenty years ago of of a university environment, for example. I agree with you, and there are many evils I think associated with. Social media these days, but uh, many positives as well. And, and I think you're using it in exactly the right way. Your Twitter handle is Prof, And if you break that down, I can see how you got that. Yes, yes. M-A-C-K-I-N-P-R-O-F. So McMaster Kinesiology Professor. There you go. Stu, it's been really uh, excellent talking to you. Very interesting indeed. Thank you so much. It's been my pleasure, Peter. Thanks for having me on the show. My pleasure. And if you'd like to find out more about uh, Stu's work, I'll put the details into the show notes for this episode at our website, Live Long and Master Aging, Llama Podcast, Llama being the acronym that we use for Live Long and Master Aging, LlamaPodcast.com. This episode of the podcast was brought to you in association with Amazentis, a Swiss life science company. It's pioneering cutting edge, clinically validated cellular nutrition under its timeline brand. And if you enjoy what we do, you can rate and review us at Apple Podcasts. You can follow us in social media. Our handle is Llama Podcast. Direct message me at Peter Bowes. Many thanks for listening. Health optimization is what this podcast is all about. And that means taking care of our mitochondria, the energy centers of our cells. Physical strength, avoiding frailty is key. And that's why the science behind urolithin A and the work of Timeline Nutrition is so interesting. You can find out more and get a discount code at our website and in the show notes for this episode.